Hello, hello. Welcome to Mixed Asian Media Festival. My name is Michaela Trinaski Holland. I am the creative producer of Manfest. My pronouns are she, her, sometimes they, them. I am uh, currently on the unceded lands of the Canarse Lenape people, otherwise known as New York. I am a mixed race woman with medium brown skin, almond eyes, um, dark black hair, and an awesome undercut that I just got redone so I feel nice and fresh. Um, and behind me is a white wall with a red painting with a blue dot and a yellow painting. Uh, yeah, I'm super stoked to be here today. So I'm going to allow uh, my fellow panelists, basically moderators too, because these people are completely dope and could moderate themselves in their own panel. So this is going to be a blast. Um, I'm going to hand it over first to Lauren Lola. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Lola, pronouns are she, her, and I am the director of programming for Mixation Media Fest. I am coming to you from the Chochenyo Ohlone Territory in the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. I have shoulder length black hair, dark brown eyes, and medium tan skin. And behind me is a white wall with a poster of a window that leads out into a tree. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Michael Strange, aka Kuiapi. Take it away. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, Kuyapi, Patrick Michael Strange. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I have, uh, uh, oh, descriptors is so wild for me. Uh, brown eyes, bald head. I have a hat on, black hat, black hoodie. Um, I'm in my studio, which is super geeked out. Marvel comic stuff, comic books all over the place. Um, super nerd. Um, I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, in particular, Northern Virginia, and I'm super excited and delighted to be amongst these two uh, other amazing mixed Asian Pinoys. So much pride right now. I'm beaming. That's what I'm radiating. So I'm radiating Pinoy vibe, love, energy right now. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Yes, and so for anyone who, you know, may or may not know, uh, this is the Mixed Pinoy panel, which means that what you see in front of you today are three people of mixed Filipino descent. Uh, what you might not know about the Philippines is that it's a small uh, archipelago of islands that is located um, east of Asia, in the mainland Asia. Um, the original name, the Philippines, was actually a colonized term to even begin with which is semi-problematic. We were colonized by the Spanish. We were sub tried to be colonized by the Dutch. We were definitely colonized by the Americans. Um, and the Philippines is actually named after King Philip. Um, but what it was was a disparate island of indigenous peoples. Um, and what it has become is a very mixed race island of not just people who identify as Filipino, but Filipinos themselves are of mixed descent because we are sort of this crazy mixture of multiple indigenous peoples that we had never had contact with each other um, before sort of industrialization and modernization, but also the colonization that happened on our lands with the Spanish and the Americans and some of the Dutch. So we come from a very proud mixed race race of, of mixedness. Um, I just want to say that my mixedness is uh, half Filipino and then in my other half I have French Canadian, Portuguese, um, a little bit of Native Indigenous, Native American Indigenous, like to the North American, um, because I have that French Canadian Indigenous sort of blend in my grandmother. Um, so yeah, I'm just super stoked to be here today with y'all. Um, I want to hand it over to uh, Patrick Kuya P first. For anyone who doesn't know, again, this is a place I want to educate. Kuya means big brother. Um, I believe in Tagalog, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so many dialects. Whenever someone says, do you speak Filipino? It's the wrong thing to say because there's so many dialects yeah, in right? the Philippines. <laughs> it's like, Tagalog is sort of the colonized language that they want everyone to speak so that everyone yeah. can understand each other. But there's Basayan, there's Ilocano, and there's so many more that I don't even know of. Um, so yeah, Kuya Pete, take it away. Tell us a little bit about why you're proud to be Filipino. Tell us a little bit about if you know of anything in your background, in your Filipino background, if you know the history of your parents, your family, wow. your heritage, like, like lay it on us. Okay. Wow. That's, that's, that's a wow. That's a long one, a crazy one. And one I'm still trying to find out information um, on. So mm -hmm. for those that also don't know, I, last year I started a show with the Nerds of Color who I'm a, a member of, along with Lauren Lola. What's up, Lauren? Um, uh, and uh, 
it's called show pal show, but because we're living under like, you know, pandemic times, which I felt were like the end of times. I was like, I gotta do something that reps me and my people and my culture. And so I was like, let me do show pal show to help, you know, celebrate our people and also help do some voyage of self discovery uh, to learn more. Cause as a Filipino American that grew up in the States and around the world as a, a Navy kid, um, who wasn't taught to me. And then come to find out in another crazy way is and learning more about the Philippines. When I would ask my mother about the Philippines, she didn't have much information either herself because of the colonization of Americans uh, in, in the Philippines. She was being taught US history more so than Philippine history. So mm -hmm. I really had to dig. And so not to date myself a little bit, but uh, I'm one of those old America online guys, AKA AOL and uh, you know, dial up internet. So that was the best I could do besides going to the library. And I went to the library a lot and uh, I love the library, but so I could only do so much, you know, looking at, at the library, then going on AOL. Um, but what really helped me and why I bring up AOL is there was a chat room before we had like, you know, MySpace, Facebook, it was called the Panoi Panay chat room. Um, if for those that are familiar with that, and that helped uh, me find others that were searching for information. They would recommend uh, books and, uh, you know, just various means to just get this information. And so that helped a lot. Um, but uh, going back to like my heritage and what I know, my parents met uh, through the military, which is how a lot of us made it here. Um, my father uh, is English, Irish, a uh, white man from San Francisco, California. Uh, he got stationed in the Philippines. They met at Subic Bay, you know, the, the former base there. My mom is from Cavite. Um, and she, uh, yeah, they met and fell in love. Uh, uh, one of a funny aspect of their love story is they were at like a, a brothel bar uh, that, you know, uh, she said my wife, my mom, what is one of those people that shares too much, which I think is a trait of a lot of us Filipinos. We give way too much information, more than we would like sometimes. But yeah, they're like, yeah, we met at a brothel, but I wasn't working it. I was working the bar. And uh, your father came in there with all his friends and stuff. And uh, yeah, we fell in love. And that's how you and your father met. And then you were made in Japan because I went with him to Japan after we met like three or four months afterwards. And that's how you were made. I'm like, I don't need that information, mom. Like, yeah, you could have a made in Japan tattoo on the bo bottom of your foot or something. Like, wow. So uh, yeah, that's my parents, y'all. Um, there were hippies, you know, my dad was a hippie, you know, from San Francisco, hippie sailor met in the Philippines and then felt they fell in love and was raised all around the world. But um, yeah, so as a mixed kid, growing up, you know, with a mother that didn't know too much because of the colonization of the Philippines, uh, but then also, uh, assimilating to Western culture. You know, they knew our, we were gonna live in the States eventually. Uh, I was born in San Diego, California. Four years after that, we moved to Stigonella, Sicily, uh, you know, the little island at the end of the boot of Italy. And then, uh, and then all over the world, four years here, four years there, military child life. Um, so wanting to try to fit in and learn myself, um, not feeling uh, I could relate with a lot of people, too Filipino for Filipinos. I mean, too American for Filipinos, too white for Filipinos, too, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, just on both sides of the part, I'm like losing my train of thought right now, but you know, could never find a, 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 a tribe because I was, again, you know, not much of anything enough or enough for everyone. So um, I found Solace in comic books, again, which is why I'm in my Marvel studio right now. Um, cause at least, you know, from traveling, traveling place to place, you couldn't keep friends for a long time. My friends became Peter Parker in the, the pages of these comic books. Those, that was the consistent friend I found. And then uh, as you get older and you try to connect with people, um, when you're different, uh, yeah, it's, again, it's hard to find your tribe. So, uh, you kind of discover yourself. And so, uh, I got really into history. Uh, got really upset with white people, finding about what they did to my people in the Philippines. I became woke as hell. Um, really had some distrust towards my father. And then because I also would see it when he would be out on deployment, uh, a lot of these aunties and, well, aunties, you know, would get together and then they would talk about, you know, the only reason they came here was because they wanted to, you know, and I can't blame them for that. It was to get a better life. Uh, but 
you know, it was just sad state of affairs and then just the abuse that would also happen. So just a lot of information that I needed to, you know, in, input as a kid and grow up and know the difference between right or wrong, being a good man, good, you know, and, and being a husband and, you know, just information overload. And so that just made me just dig into learning about myself and the culture later, you know, kind of traversing that, you know, relationship with my father. Um, and, and, you know, he's a very conservative Republican, you know, and uh, I'm very different than him, super liberal. Um, I'm going on a tangent right now, so I apologize, Michaela and Laura, but it's just, you know, so there's, there's a lot of deep seatedness that I think pushed me into the arts and to activism and to then just, you know, discovering the knowledge for myself. And then once I discovered the knowledge for myself, now kind of try, trying to find find ways to, through Show Pal Show, through as a father myself now, and, and through my script writing and, and just other works to just help change the world to create a better future. Um, yeah, there you go. I, I went all over the place. I apologize. But yeah, that's what started this wokeness, right? So Michaela? Oh my yeah. gosh. Yes. So, so many good things. I first want to say, you know, when Patrick talks about a lot of us getting here because of the military, um, that the Filipino um, country after World War II was brought in as a territory, I believe, or like sort of a sanctioned nation under the guise of American, of the United States of America. And one of the uh, cross relations of that was America built a ton of military bases within the Philippines, but they also offered native Filipino people of that time the ability to come to America if they drafted themselves into the U US Navy, the US military. So my family story is my grandpa drafted himself in the US Navy at 18 years old because he saw there could potentially be a better life for his family. And then that's how my family all got here, not just my grandpa, my grandma, and my mom and my uncles and aunts, but also all my extended family, like my grandpa's military engagement with the U.S. is what sort of seeded our Nidifan clan is what we call it into where they still live now in Milpitas. So like so many references and so many reflections there. And I think just saying like um, one other thing that really struck me about your story is that that feeling of going back in our history and realizing that we are a colonized people and then seeing a sort of version of colonization sometimes in our parents' relationship where you're like, wait a second. Like yeah. the Philippines, the Filipinos were like the original colonized people who became mixed race, right? But now I'm the like 100 year later, 200 year later version of this seeing for me, at least my white father and my uh, Filipino mother. And the good news is, is like I, my mom and dad, they met in high school in Milpitas, which is known as like the Filipino like center of the world. And he was a white wrestler and she was a Filipino like athlete. And they sort of met under like the American dream. So it's very interesting. Um, just the reflections of both of our stories, Patrick. And so I want to lend the mic over to Lauren. Thank you so much for being patient. Let's hear your story. Let's hear your Marvel origin Pinoy uh, <laughs> movie story. <laughs> Okay, well, um, as far as being Filipino American goes, I identify as third generation. Now, when I use when I count the generations of Americans, I use the system that's used in the Japanese American community, where you know the person who immigrated here is first generation American, which makes more sense to me because it's like shouldn't the person who immigrated here count for something? So I'm third generation Filipino American. Already very unusual. Even more unusual is that um, usually when people think of mixed race Asians, they think that the mom is Asian and the dad is white. But for me, it is the other way around. <laughs> my dad is Filipino. My mom is white. Also, they were both born in the U.S., so neither of them are immigrants. Um, on my Filipino side, my my grandfather is the one who immigrated here. He was uh, what was ca what's called a pensionado, so he was here on scholarship to. Surprise, surprise, practice medicine um, here in the States. He was one of the first Filipinos to be allowed to practice medicine in the U.S. He is he was originally from uh, the region Bicol, specifically the province of Ginobatan. That's where my family is from. We, um, My dad has made clear that we do have some Spanish lineage, so you can probably guess where that came from, the Spanish colonization of the Philippines, which is why a lot of us have Spanish or Spanish-sounding last names, hence my last name. Um, yeah, that's like, as far as, like, that's, I guess, the immigration story of how, 
we came over here and how I came to be mixed Filipino. Um, I elaborate more in depth on this in a panel discussion I did last month with Alex. But what I will say here is that there was and is a lot of trauma on that side of the family. And unfortunately, a lot of it has remained unresolved. Um, and so as a result of that, my dad pretty much like estranged us from our Filipino heritage. I did not grow up Filipino. I grew up in a predominantly white household, even though I grew up in the Bay Area, which as Michaela said, it has a huge Filipino community here. Um, but it wasn't until I think high school where I started making the effort to explore that more and come to understand my history on that side of the family better. Um, even though I started in high school, it was, really wasn't until college where it started to really come into fruition that now as an adult, even more so, especially, you know, like being in San Francisco a lot and being among so much Filipinas, which is the Filipino district in San Francisco. Um, yeah, I'm at a point now where I can comfortably identify as being mixed race and as Filipino American. Um, and I even did a piece about that for Mixed Asian Media last year, a few months after the trailer for Ryan the Last Dragon came out, which is that, you know, being mixed race and being Filipino are very distinct identities in themselves. That to bring that together um, has been an inter interesting to navigate, um, especially within the Asian American community. Like you, both of you would know is that, um, Filipino Americans and Southeast Asians in general don't always get a lot of recognition for what we do. It's getting better in recent years, but there's still there's still ways to go on that. And to be mixed race, I mean, you might as well throw us under the bus on that. I mean, like we again, that's also starting to improve. But even still, like when we do see mixed Asian stories on TV or whatever, that's mainly from an East Asian perspective. And I'm just like, obviously, we're here too. Uh, so as someone who is working towards becoming a professional writer and who has done a lot of writing, my effort now is to incorporate more of both sides of my identity into the stories I tell without without fe feeling forced. I just, my goal is to make it feel as natural as possible for me to, um, as the writer and as the storyteller. Um, yeah, I think it just about does it on that. Yeah, I feel like, thank you for sharing Lola. And obviously like, all shapes and all sizes and all ways, right? There's a lot of similarities with Patrick's and mine stories. There's a lot of similarities in your story with our stories, even if it doesn't feel similar right off the bat, like trauma and family is real, being sort of like stripped away of like your identity. Like, yeah. you know, I didn't grow up fully immersed in Filipino culture because my family moved really far away from my Filipino family. So it was like a Christmas, Thanksgiving, lumpia, adobo experience for me, yeah. right? But it wasn't like a, a day to day and so, I feel very similar to you when I really started to realize my Filipino culture was something to be proud of when I didn't, when I left a very small white community in high school where they called me Asian persuasion, you know, and like moved oh. into UC Irvine where like there is a predominant both traditional mainland Asia and Southeast Asian environment and then got involved in Kaba Modern as a dancer and then kind of started to gently find myself at Kaba Bayan meetings, but it was like, Similar to Patrick, I was like, I think I'm too Americanized to be hanging out with all these, and not that they weren't lovely, but like I feel too white as a Filipino and I feel too Filipino to hang out with all the like white jocks. Like, I don't know, it was just a weird moment I had in college too. So like yeah. so many reflective points. One thing I do see that is also a common thread among us is the identity within mythology and, and storytelling of like, heroic characters or even monstrous characters. So um, mm. Lola, I'd love for you to talk just kind of what you were talking about, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pull that thread a little bit more. I love Interview with an Ashwong. I love that piece. I think it's the perfect example of how you're blending your Filipino-ness and your American-ness. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that project and just how you discovered and thought of and like how that project came to you. Yeah, um, actually, before I get to it, uh, Patrick, have you seen it already? I have not, but it's okay. I really want to see it. Uh, just, okay. You know, my time is crazy, uh, but I mad props to you on that, Laura. Look, Lauren. For sure. Um, I did talk about, I made, okay, full disclosure, I did make an appearance on Show Pop Show earlier in the year. So I did talk to him about this. So he already knows like the gist of 
how it, how it came together. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's probably wise to identify what Aswang is. And Aswang is an umbrella term for mainly like these shape-shifting creatures in Filipino mythology. Um, and like by yeah, umbrella term, I mean like a huge umbrella. But I think the most commonly associated Aswang would be the kind that like, you know, feed off of unborn fetuses and small children. Uh, but the Aswang that I featured in my piece is like a mix of that as well as the kind that can morph into like a giant dog or in my case, a wolf, because of course. Because um, like she's from a mixed family, because why the hell not? Uh, so, interview with an, <laughs> so interview with an Aswang was originally a Zoom play I did earlier this year where a college student interviews her friend who happens to be an Aswang about what her life is like for a school project. Um, yeah, this was done for a Seattle-based theater company called Rainy Day Artistic Collective. It was done in February. It had a all Filipino American cast, and I was one of the. I was not only the writer, but I was also the co-director. Um, and then, like maybe a few weeks prior to that production happening, I reached out to my co-director Laura, and I asked her, "Hey, what do you think about us turning this into a short film?" And she was immediately like, "Yes, let's do it." I should mention, um, Laura uh, is Japanese American, so she actually had to do quite a bit of research on her and to get a general understanding of the mythology that was being explored in this piece um, and stuff like that. So then I brought up with the cast, they were all on board a few days prior to actually showing the thing for Zoom, we recorded it. And you can watch it on Mixation Media now for until Sunday. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, it's not my first time playing with Filipino folklore in my writing. I've done other instances of it, but I guess this is the first time where you can really, you know, you can actually see for yourself. Um, but it's, it's a part of Filipino culture that I absolutely love, not only as a Filipino American, but also as a writer, which is, you know, another part of my identity. I think maybe the weird part is that, like, when I announced that this was made into a film, it was the same week the trailer for Trace they dropped <laughs> from Netflix. So that was quite a fun week for me in that. Um, but yeah, that's just, you know, I would love to tap into more uh, storytelling involving Filipino mythology in the future. Uh, but this is just one example of that. Yeah. I know what I'm watching I later. <laughs> <laughs> I know what He's I'm watching. I'm going to finally watch it, Lauren. I promise now. It's so good. I got to watch it as a as a screen play, as a play when when they when they produced it as a play earlier this year, a Zoom play. But oh. I mean, sitting with us today is probably one of the most robust minds within the blending of Filipino pride and amazing pop culture, both Lola and Kuya P. So Kuya <laughs> P, like, drop us some notes, drop us some knowledge. Like, what are you seeing in? the nerd world? What are you seeing in like pop culture that you're super excited about that like makes you stoked to be Filipino? I mean, obviously Lola's gonna be totally kicking butt in the next few years, but like- Oh, hell yeah. We love Lola, but who else are we like <laughs> seeing on the rise? Is Marvel doing a Filipino comic? Like what what, what should we know as Phil, as Pinoy's? Okay, well, I, I, I did you, didn't you didn't you mention, mention a bud, budget, uh, Lauren, a second ago, which I say on Netflix? Well, so, I mentioned Trese, but budget. Was, yeah, by yeah. budget. Yeah, but budget is on Netflix with uh, Trese Budget Tan. Shout out to Budget and and Kaji ba Balusiamo. I think I'm messing up his last name, but uh, they they have the amazing graphic novel Trese, which is an anime on Netflix. Highly, highly recommend. And a bunch of uh, mutual friends with me and Lauren, uh, our friend, our, our friends are voice actors on that. So shout out to uh, Earl and everybody, Ruben, all of our friends that are voice actors on that, uh, killing it. So I love it. All the representation is in front of the camera, behind the camera, all around it, creative. Uh, I love it. Uh, it's beautiful. So check out Tresse. Um, we have, uh, I just recently recorded a Shang-Chi uh, AAPI representation going forward with the MCU and uh, my friend Rachel Laco. Uh, she put it out there just like Simu did about, hey, uh, you know, when Simu got the role of Shang-Chi, it was like, hey, Marvel, what's up? And so Rachel put out there, you know, hey, what's up with Wave? So uh, we'll fingers crossed on that. That is uh, our, our big Filipino character really at Marvel. There's some other like sidebar Filipino characters. There's the Triumph Division. There's um, the 
uh, Ari Agbiani, I think, is like the Filipino Captain America in a recent Captain America storyline. So we have a Filipino cap, which is dope and female. I love it because our females uh, are, you know, you got the Madrima, Madrigma. I, I'm going to mess up, you know, I guess T Tagalog was my, my mom didn't give me that whole Tagalog lessons and stuff because I was living in Italy at the time. So she strayed away from teaching me Tagalog. Again, that whole colonizer thing and kind of, you know, mixed kid Asian problems that, you know, I, I got upset with because I wanted to learn the language. But, you know, females, our, our Filipino women, I love y'all so much. Y'all are so amazing. But that madr madrigma spirit that y'all have is just amazing. And so uh, I love that we have a Filipino cap. We have Wave. So our women are to the forefront. We have Darna, uh, which if who've, those aren't familiar with Darna is like our, the original Wonder Woman. Um, there, there's been notes that before William Moulton Marston created uh, Wonder Woman. He was peeping. Darna was created before that uh, overseas in the Philippines. He was peeping some of those scripts uh, and, and stories. So uh, what you know about Wonder Woman, y'all, is based off of Darna. Don't get it twisted. We was killing it beforehand. So we have amazing warrior Wonder Women. Um, I love it. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, comic route. Uh, I, I know uh, as part of my actors Barkata, shout out to the Philippine ex actors Barkata. Uh, with my, my my girl Denise Cabanella, Earl Bailon, Jacqueline Amy, Sheila Tejada, uh, Ruben Wee, uh, JB Tadina, uh, Zedric Rosaro, uh, my squad, uh, Caitlin Fay. Uh, we we got a lot some films that we're working on. Uh, shout out to Andrianne Walter, uh, Biana Katbegan. Uh, that's our whole squad. We we got some work in the pipeline that we're brewing. There's a renaissance happening, y'all. Uh, shout out to my girl, uh, Eileen Kabiling and uh, Diana Paragas. We've all been communicating. We got a little Filipinx filmmakers group up on Facebook that we're, we're, we're throwing ideas at. Shout out to Patricio Janelsa. Yo, uh, that shout out to Lauren. Lauren put me up with Patricio Janelsa, who is the creator of Lumpia and Lumpia with a Vengeance, and with Earl and with uh, April Absinthe. Amazing film in itself. They're killing it. They're, we're going to have a, another Kickstarter campaign, I think, for their next a comic book. And then they're going to work, hopefully, on a Olympia movie. I can't say too much. I got to be careful with spoilers. I talk too much sometimes, people, especially if y'all get me talking. And y'all don't see it, but they're looking at me right now like, Patrick, just, you know, hey, uh, I just love my people. We are killing it. And there's, there's a lot of positive vibes and energy that's happening. Um, I'm working on a Lapu Lapu script, y'all. Uh, I, I want to tell the story of, of uh, to me, he's our Filipino Black Panther, if you will, you know, that could really rep for our culture and tribe and Southeast Asians, because, you know, there's not enough of our Southeast Asian stories. Uh, I've been talking to my man, Eric Esteban. Shout out to Eric, comedian, actor. Uh, he did a play about the Manongs that, that toured the country. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hollering at him about that, maybe bringing some stuff back like that. Um, Patricio, you know, talking about Filipino DJs, you know, the DJs out on the West Coast. The DJ scene before a lot of hip hop was brewing. Shout out to our Filipino DJs that kicked it off with like Qbert and all that. Um, I'm going all over the place again, Michaela, because I'm just talking. Y'all aren't jumping in to save me because I can just talk your ear off. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. I mean, and this is important because, like, yes, we're mixed, and yes, we have that mixed, but like. We love the fact that we're mixed. We also love the fact there are people out there that aren't mixed that are totally kicking butt in entertainment, yeah. in media. And like the fact that we get to see ourselves in, the fact that we get to feel, I feel connected to our culture through folklore, through storytelling, through yes. like mythology, through also seeing ourselves in the mainstream, through the music, through the films, through the music videos. Um, taking it, I feel like I'm like the history teacher here or the history teacher here. Like, <laughs> and I love that you are doing that. I love those nuggets. <laughs> um, I think the one that I want to see, and I'm throwing it out right now, like who's doing the biopic about Neves Fernandez? Does anyone know who Neves Fernandez is? Mm, remind me. She's the, she's the Filipino school teacher who like left her like position as a school teacher and turned herself into a captain and was the first Filipino female guerrilla fighter to fight off the Japanese. And she led an army it. of over a hundred natives that killed over 200 Japanese soldiers with bolos and homemade shotguns. And there's literally a picture of her holding this American soldier by, I think it's like the hair and like a, like a knife to his neck. And she's just like showing him how to kill somebody. Like, oh, not I remember that now. Not that yes. this is okay. 
I need that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, okay. I know we, who you're talking about. Yeah. I think my a friend of mine produced that. picture, produced stickers with this image on it. So I know who you're talking about now. So, so that yeah, reminds me like a bolo knife. Did that happen during the, the world war occupation? When, when did that happen? Okay. I think because uh, I, I had Diana Paragas who shout out to Yellow Rose, her amazing film. Diana! With Tony. All the love to Diana. She's such an amazing human being in spirit, so giving. Uh, when I had her on Show Pal Show, she gave us details of her next project that she's writing after Yellow Rose. It's called Liz. The tentative title is called Lizards, and it's about the amazing warrior women, guerrilla rebels, uh, rebels in, in during the occupation. Japan was in the Philippines, and then uh, and them fighting back because y'all was killing it. the men. Were you know out and doing their thing, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm mad at my brothers. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But y'all held it down. Y'all <laughs> took care of the household. But y'all are also fighting against this Japanese occupation. And so she has this amazing story about that, this historical piece. But it's also a musical. Because, you know, she is she started out off as a musician before she got into filmmaking and, and documentary work. Um, so she's intermixing, like, amazing music. Because she also wrote a lot of the music uh, that... Uh, Evelyn Noblezada sang in Yellow Rose. So she's doing that with lizards. And uh, she has quite a few amazing people lined up. I don't want to spoil stuff. Um, and also, it's not all the way there yet. But uh, yeah, well, it said on the show, Pasho, she has Bruno and Mars in mind for like this DJ guy <laughs> character. Because uh, so, she said it on show, Pasho, I'll say that. She has Bruno Mars in mind to play like the DJ, kind of like uh, how like. Uh, Oh my God, Robin Williams was in Good Morning Vietnam. Kind of like that Good Morning Vietnam mm. DJ style character. She has Bruno in mind. And then she did drop Ruby Ibarra as a possible guerrilla rebel, which I think, and I had Ruby on the show. She is absolutely amazing. Baddest female MC on the planet. And she's Filipina. I love it. Shout out to Ruby. Lauren's Ruby. friend too. R Lauren knows what's up, Ruby. Um, she helped me make those connections. So I love you so much for that, Lauren. Uh, Ruby's amazing. Show past show episode dropping soon with, with Ruby. Uh, we got more into detail, but yeah, I can't wait for that. If that film happens, uh, it's probably a year or two down the line because, you know, uh, Diana's blowing the fuck up and I'm so, I'm loving it. We love to see it. And so she's going to yeah. have quite a few other projects before she can get lizards out there, but I'm dying for lizards. If that's going to be the title to have a story set in the Philippines, repping our amazing women, rebel warriors, and uh, and then it's also a musical. That's gonna be a weird twist, but I'm I'm here for it, right? Can I be an, Can I be a dancer? Can I be an extra? Like yo, right? Gonna, like, like I'll do anything. Yes. Let's I'll get I'll in do it. It. I will do it for free. Let me rep for the culture <laughs> and the people. <laughs> um, speaking of Yellow Rose, which if for people who don't know is an incredible film by Diana that uh, went into the world of being a Filipino born and raised in Texas or yes. um, who has a mother who is being deported by ICE and like is just and this this incredibly talented uh, young female rights songwriter who's played by Eva Nobozada um, wants to be a country singer and Shout out not only to the Yellow Rose team, but also Tremendous PR, who is also founded by a Pinoy. Who yes, is also Jeremiah. Of Irvine. Jeremiah Abraham. So speaking That's of like, Pinoy's right being culture shifters and makers, um, a big part of Filipino culture that I've become connected with is through dance. So I want to give a shout out to Arnel Carvalho. Carval Carval Carvalho. Um, who is the founder of Cabo Modern. For those who don't know, Cabo Modern is the first Southern California crew to go beyond just doing traditional like Filipino dances at the Cabo Bayan events and the cultural night events and decided to start blending Americanized versions of those things. And that basically blew up the whole Southern California dance culture of being in dance crews. And so he started Cabo Modern at UC. I, and then from UCI, it went to CSU Long Beach, and then it just sort of created this rapid fire. And now, most of the American Best Dance crew, old back in the day, like crews, came out of the origination of Cabo Modern on the West Coast. So, like, yeah, dance is incredible for us as Filipinos. I feel like movement, music, creativity, um, singing, obviously. Shout out to Leia Salonga. I do want to ask, though, like, what makes you all proud to be Pinoy? What makes you proud to be Filipino? Like, even if it is the food or even if it is the, like, music, like, what is the like, the top three things you're always like, this, this, and this, and that's, like, that's where I'm at with it. Uh, Lola, would you like to go first? 
Uh, Patrick, maybe you can take this one first. I want to think about it. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, our people. I, I started, the very first thing I said when I recorded the very first episode of, with Show Pal Show was, I love my people. So, you know, going back to earlier of, at the start of this panel, you know, I was raised all over the world and uh, I wasn't white enough for white people. I wasn't Filipino for Filipino people. But the but the people that did really actually show me love more than anybody else that accepted me were my Filipino people. Despite not being Filipino enough, they showed me love and continue to show me love. And, and you know, we are a caring people. Our, our food is amazing, absolutely. So they would make sure you're very well fed. Uh, even when you are, you just ate, um, have some food. Cause that's how we show love, you know? So they, they would still continuously here, just have some food. Um, so just, just that giving nature and, and the kind heart. Uh, yeah, we have, you know, some crab mentalities here and there within our culture. And I'm sure we could talk on that, you know, uh, as mixed kids, you know, as well. But for the most part, they always lead with love and just the relationships I've had uh, for those that were in my circles uh, that, set the tone for everything else. You know what I'm saying? If this is how people should be and can be, that's who I want to be. Um, and and that was always it. There was never a feeling of otherness with the with true Filipinos that I was around that I felt, you know, that I didn't feel that I wasn't getting with everybody else. You know what I'm saying? So just that overwhelming sense of family unity and love that weren't even blood relation. And, th and that's another crazy thing that I love about us. Like everybody's your uncle, your ate, your kuya. You know what I'm saying? Like that just sense of community was just the absolutely best, which just made me love our culture. And then when, as a student of history, like I said that earlier, when I dug into history, learning about, you know, obviously I'm growing up in America, learning American history and then seeing what that was, but then just learning the real history, you know, go outside of that. Um, how, like I said, I'm trying to do a Lapu Lapu script, how badass Lapu Lapu was to just, you know, F that. Okay, Magellan, you think you won't come here? I ain't having that. So that was an immense pride feeling that we were like one of the first resistors to colonization because that's really the story of the world. It's always been about the person who had the bigger stick and to find out that it was in the Philippines where we kind of laid it down and kind of set some of the groundwork of resistance uh, was amazing. And it's sad that, you know, it, it lost out throughout time, uh, but again, the bigger stick men, 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 uh, mentality. But uh, that just made me so proudful that, you know, despite even those ups and downs, uh, the, the immense pride that we have, like when and anybody just even have a drop of Filipino in them, you know, we come out and support with everything. And I absolutely love that about us. You know what I'm saying? So it's that sense of community, culture, people. Uh, history and pride, activism, resistance. Um, that's everything that I want to be. I want to lead with love and, and love with all of myself. And, and uh, our food is fucking dope and our people are dope. We dance like a motherfucker. We can sing. We're entertained. We're everything, y'all. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. I think one thing I really resonated with was like, we come out. So like my one of my cousins just got married in Phoenix and it was like, my my aunt who is who's white and because my my mom's whole family just became mixed babies because of the way they grew up in the Milpitas area. But anyway, my white who my aunt who's white was crying because she was like, when we told the Nidafan clan that Johnny was getting married, you all didn't in Phoenix, which is kind of a random spot for all of us. Like none of you said no, none of you questioned it. Everyone was like, when's the date? We're gonna be there, and like you all came out, and like we were literally the dance floor, like. Like from auntie to uncle to baby cousin, because there's like 14 cousins in my native fan clan family. Like we made it happen in the most like loving, supportive way we could. Um, so I love that. To me too, like one thing I love about, I think the way I feel most connected, one of the ways I feel most connected to my Filipino heritage is like the ocean and the beach and surfing, like mm. running barefoot on the sand in the ocean, like near the ocean, like where my feet barely hit the tide coming in. And I'm just like, I just feel like I'm connected to something much greater than me from much farther that. away. But like, that. yeah, it's like one of my favorite moments. Um, Lola, take it away. What's what 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 things are you proud of? What things make you feel connected? What things are like? Yes. Okay, I just want to be particular with how I answer this, just because once again, I did mention that there's quite a bit of trauma in my Filipino side of the family that has, you know, again, has been largely unresolved. But I think that what connects me to my Filipino side is probably like 
maybe stories I hear about my great aunt, my dad, Tita, who was like the most influential person in his life when he was growing up. She was a resistance fighter in World War II. Um, so like she was a school teacher by day and she was uh, working with the Philippine resistance by night. So yeah, like that's just like one of the, one of many cool things about her that I really wish I got, could have gotten to know her while she was still alive. Um, aside from that, I think maybe also the food, just because that's like when we think of culture, when we think of having access to a culture, food is like one of the most accessible things. And of course, that depends on where you live, of course. But fortunately, I do live in the Bay Area, huge Filipino community here. So it's very easy for me to, you know, be able to have the food that I kind of can't help but wonder what it would have been like had I grown up with it and not just you know, have it now as an adult. Um, what else? I Again, like the Filipino mythology, which I really dig. I should, <laughs> this is an interesting story. Um, my, I found out my family was never, they never believed in Aswangs or anything like that. They were never really superstitious, um, which is a little opposite of what I was expecting. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, it is what it is. Um, but still, I love learning about it. I don't know everything about Philippine mythology. There's just so much. Um, but to have, you know, shows and comics like Teresa out there, I think will definitely help me with connecting to that more and learning more about it. And then I have, I, okay, I haven't heard anyone mention this yet, but I guess the martial arts as well. I am not a professional, but I have no one had any martial arts for over 17 years now. And um, within recent years, especially this past summer, I've been picking up a screamer. Um, and that has been like another motivator, again, wanting to connect with my Filipino side of the family. And also um, as a response to the anti-Asian hate crimes that have been happening this past year, I feel like a lot of the techniques that are used in Eskrima, um I think would really help in situations like that. And yeah, there's just so much. Uh, there's just so much that, you know, despite the trauma that is very imminent in my family, I'm glad that I was able to find the good aspects of what means to be Filipino through other outlets. I got a question for you guys real quick. And yeah. thank you for that, Lauren, uh, that I, I kind of deal with myself. And uh, if this question is hard for you guys, then I totally understand and you don't have to answer it. But like, what is the most complicated aspect of our upbringing as Filipinos, as mixed Filipinos, uh, the, the, that you both have with our heritage. Um, for me is uh, I grew up in a very Christian household. And, uh, you know, to me, again, like I said, when I became more aware of our people and our culture and that colonization aspect, you know, again, I did a lot of research on Lapu Lapu. Lapu Lapu is like my guy, my, my you know, because again, I'm working on this script. And, uh, Magellan was a man who brought Christianity to the Philippines. And uh, before that, you know, we had, a, and to the point of Aswangs and the deities and all these mystical things, but also it's rooted in our history and, and, and that we had prior to the colonization. Um, but I have a very difficult time with uh, Catholicism and Christianity. Um, I was brought up like that and I believe in that. Uh, to a degree, there, there's different aspects. And that's why I said this is probably complicated for you guys uh, to talk on this. And again, I understand. But um, yeah, I, I was raised very religious, but then I kind of pulled that because again, as a a student of history and as a person of the world and having friends of all various backgrounds, race, creeds, colors, uh, religions, um, I couldn't get down that with the certain uh, hatred towards the other groups that is a part of Catholicism, the, no matter what sect you're in. And so uh, that's always been a problem of mine. And that kind of goes against a lot of Filipinos, you know what I'm saying? Because we are very rooted in that in that Christianity aspect. Um, but we also have the, a large population of Muslims in the Philippines and I have a lot of Muslim friends. So, you know, religion is a hard thing to talk about, but that is one thing for me that's difficult. And, and one that I'm trying to figure out ways of different conversations with other friends and to also just dissect it, you know, a little bit, because I think we need to confront it. Um, because I think it separates us as well. And I'm, again, I'm a love cat and I want to bring us together. And I just want to find ways that we can just connect more and, uh, 
you know, and religion sometimes separates us that because, um, yeah, because we, we all know the history of religion in the world and fights, most fights and wars are started because of that. But it's one that I deal with a lot. Um, and uh, because my wife is very Christian and, uh, you know, we have we pray or my my daughter, you know, we, we acknowledge the Lord, you know, every night. But I have a very complicated relationship with that because of what I know about our homeland, my roots growing up and just the world in general. Um, so anyway, I went a little bit longer. I'm sorry. Cause again, like I said, I can talk. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great question. I'm so glad you flipped the moderation over. Um, for me in full transparency, I definitely have the same emotions and feelings. I also was raised in a super conservative Christian household. My grandparents are very Catholic. It's so interesting, though, because for me, where I started really butting up against that idea uh, is in my sexuality. Um, I identify as queer, um, which doesn't mean I have a preference of who I'm expressing love to. It just means that I don't see gender, really. And so that means I've been with both male identifying, female identifying in partnership um, and just in general uh, intimacy. But that also means that I'm exploring, like, more of my gender fluidity and my non-binariness, which is uh, another panel we did here at Manfest. And so the interesting part too, like like you said, Patrick, is like going back into my cultural history. I just recently was a part of a uh, an incredible dance theater performance where we explored uh, the Bali. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up the I'm gonna mess up the the yeah, the words as well. Bali Baia and Bali Bake which basically means two-spiritedness. Like there's like a, a female energy and a male energy. And these were people that were identified in indigenous cultures as people that kind of fluidly moved in and out of, uh, whether they were gender fluid or non-binary, it just sort of, it represents that. And they were loved and they were celebrated in the indigenous culture. Um, so I think that there's that. And then uh, in that world of sexuality, like my mother, who is super conservative Christian, was very much like, yeah, I can't accept this. This isn't who you are. This isn't my daughter. This isn't who I raised. And like was trying to like kind of stir up trouble through the Nidifan clan. Love you, mom, if you're watching this. But And it's interesting because my super conservative Catholic grandparents were like, great, we're just glad you're not alone. We're really happy for you. Like when I was like, if I brought a woman to Thanksgiving or Christmas, like and my grandpa, my military navy grandpa who was like one of the highest ranking filipino officers this is another story but he was the highest ranking filipino officer in the history of the navy up until the point when he retired because you know he was able to become an officer when most were just considered crew uh, stalwarts who are the people who serve food to the rest of the crew um you know he was an electronics officer he helped the vietnam during the vietnam war he would help vietnamese like who who defected uh, I believe from the Viet Cong to try and help Americans unscramble the codes of Vietnam uh, of the of the communists. Like he tried to help them pretend they knew how to scramble the code so that they could stay in America longer so they wouldn't get deported back to Vietnam. It was a whole thing. Anyway, super badass, my grandpa. Um, but he was just like, okay, as long as you're happy, I'm happy for you. It's all good. And I was like really making sure, like, are you sure this is okay? He was like, I will love and invite anyone in my household that you love and invite into your household. And I was just like, that's that moment for me where you're right. That is a sticky point. Like as Filipinos, I feel like we're so loving and accepting of people. Like you cross your threshold, you are the family. It doesn't matter like how estranged you are. It doesn't matter how long you haven't been around. And it doesn't matter if we just met you. And it doesn't matter what race you are, honestly, at the end of the day from what I've seen. Um, but then we do get that like weird tension point of exclusivity and religion, which you're right, I think is a version of uh, colonization trauma. So yeah, thank you. That's, that would be my answer. Uh, and Lola, what would be your answer? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. I had to step away. I'm in a wee workspace right now. I'm getting kicked out in like less than half an hour. So, um, but yeah, I guess maybe the most complex part about being brought up in, I guess my family is, you know, once again, I wasn't brought up Filipino. I was brought up in a predominantly white household. Um, Unlike you two, I wasn't brought up religious, um, which once again is one of the different things about me. If you were to ask my mom what she believes in, she would tell you she's an atheist. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, again, how my dad was brought up. Catholicism was basically used as a drug on him. Um, so, like, we, like, 
you know, if I were to ask, like, you know, I guess in the eyes of the church, I am Catholic because that's why I was baptized, but I wasn't brought up Catholic. Like I didn't do communion. I didn't have confirmation or anything like that. Um, so I'm just very indifferent about that. But yeah, as far as my upbringing goes, I guess, you know, the big part is just being brought up white when it is so very obvious that I'm not full white. <laughs> like, yeah, like when, especially when I was really little, like when I was a baby still, there would be people who would ask if I was adopted <laughs> Cause I was like really Asian looking when I was a baby. And then my mom has this memory of her being at the mall with my siblings and I, and people asking if she's the nanny, even though she's actually the white parent, which is a little different, but she was just so confused by it. And yeah, I mean, I think I would have been spared of a lot of confusion I had growing up had race been talked about more openly and if my Filipino side was more integrated into my upbringing because yeah because yeah I was so confused like I would look in the mirror and I'm like I look nothing like my mom and like I kind of look like her but in her words I look like her but Filipino so yeah it's just you know having to figure that out when as young as I was, was hard. And I didn't feel like I could really talk to my dad about it because for the longest time, he just flat out didn't want to have anything to do with being Filipino. There was a period of time where he referred to the Philippines as the Philistines. That's how much he really did not want to be associated with, you know, his Filipino side. Um, so it was hard. It was hard. But, um, you know, again, the more that I've learned and the more that I continue to learn, because that's basically an ongoing process, I think they're, I think they particularly, my dad is starting to come around more. Like he, we're at the point now where he'll go out and get like Filipino food from a local restaurant or something. And what, sometimes he'll come back and bring ube ice cream, which is nice. Um, we're at the point now where we'll mention like, oh, did you see this Filipino American actor in this new TV show or this new movie or something like that? So like he's opening up, up more to it, um, which says a lot for someone who's <laughs> who's admittedly very hard-headed and in so many other ways as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably like, you know, the struggle with how I was brought up. Yeah, it almost feels like, Lola, you were sort of the, the, the entry point of sort of what Patrick and I were sort of talking about maybe of like feeling estranged from Filipinexness because of some negative things, you know, like, I was at the verge of sort of pulling myself fully away from my my Filipino family and really isolating myself because of my sexuality, sort of. And, you know, I feel like, in a in a way, your father may be like the extension of that kind of process. And then you are the extension of the process of bringing him, maybe not back or closer, but just bringing him to a different degree of what his relationship to being Filipino, but also just his relationship to his general, like, Personness, um, and I find it interesting when you're like he's very hard headed and stuff. For that I was like, oh, that not that like stereotypes are very good, but like, yeah, like my family is very hard headed and stubborn. <laughs> it's complicated. I'm also yeah. very hard headed and stubborn. So guess where I got that from? Yeah. But we get stuff done. No, just kidding. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, we, we only have a few minutes left and I want to make sure we're, you know, wrapping up on a solid note. I don't want to cut anyone off. I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, we rushed through that. So how do you all want to wrap up this session? I mean, we could go, we could go anywhere. So where would we like to go next? Um, I would love for people to reach out to, to us. Well, I know for myself with Show Pal Show, um, I've been honored and blessed to have Lauren on as a guest and tell her story. I would love for you, Michaela, to, to, come on and share your whole story as well. Um, but if there's anybody out there that would like to share their stories that is watching this, uh, reach out, uh, showpowshow at gmail.com is our show email. Um, we've had amazing amount of guests, a lot of the people I've already mentioned and more on the way. Um, I would love to just have Filipino Pokemon with Show Pow Show and collect them all. I wanna rep everybody, show love and light and energy to all of our people. And uh, yeah, just celebrate them now before, you know, you know what we all know. You know, it's about giving your flowers now until you know before they pass away. And so uh, I want to rep and show love and, and, and do that. So showpowshow@gmail.com. And so you can hit me up there on email and 
follow us at show pal show uh on twitter ig and all of that so yeah uh i would like just people to just holla at us and uh talk about themselves because uh as a filmmaker as an artist as an activist um that's what i want to do with my work and if i'm inspired by your stories if i can help share your stories um, if I can write your stories as a creative for other film projects and, and anything else down the line, or just yeah, like or like I said, just have you talk to me and we share it online and just put these stories out there. Um, it's gonna make a difference and change the world, and it'll help people feel seen. And uh, that is my goal in life, and to have that for my daughter to see and have her feel seen. And uh, wanted to tell you, Michaela, because you're a dancer. My daughter is a dancer. She's in ballet. Uh, she's been in ballet for forever. You know, so that's the Filipino ness that. I was a dancer myself. I used to break. I used to break dance, hip hop, and all that. You know, Jabberwocky before Jabberwockies, and uh, <laughs> so the dance is in her. And uh, I had Carolyn Faye, the Lola from Blues Clues, who was a dancer as well before she became the Lola from Blues Clues. She was telling my daughter, you know, uh, suggesting to my daughter that you know start finding your voice now. She's thirteen, uh, but she's also not the traditional ballet body. Uh, to just finding your voice in dance, and so. Uh, I, I don't know why I went off on a complete tangent, but because I know you're a dancer and I just wanted to bring up with you that just dance is alive and well in this family, but like for dancers out there, cause I know you're a dancer, uh, that don't fit that traditional mold, especially if you're find yourself just in the ballet art form, you know, what suggestions do you have for dancers? And that's what I asked Carolyn, but like, you know, to, you know, keep it going, you know, that's her passion, that's her love, but, and we're not, and we're going to totally support her in, in that goal. But, you know, the reality of, at least in ballet, you know, it's a certain type of body type. You know, I, I love that the culture is moving towards breaking those stereotypes of body types, you know, and, and they're finding that path. But, you know, I don't know. I, I'm all over the place. But what, as a dancer, what, how was that for you? Did you dabble in ballet or did you dabble in like any other kind of styles, you know? Oh, my gosh. Literally with a few minutes to wrap up. I will say- <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Dance, no, that's good. My journey with dance is what I, helped me identify myself as a storyteller. And so I take dance into my day-to-day -day world. It's never a part of me that I lose, but there are parts of me that I'm not constantly having to dance to prove that I'm a dancer, right? And I also think for me, dance is such an important part of my life that when I take it into other spaces in different ways, people might not think. So for those who don't know, I'm a, XR, virtual reality, augmented reality producer. And the reason I think I fell into that is because I understand choreography. I understand movement. I understand interactivity. I was a dancer and performer for Disney, which helped me understand guest experience. So I just take all of the things I learned in the physical world of performance and dance, and now I get to produce these things online and in headsets and on telephones that help people maybe not move as a dancer, but help them move through an experience, right? And so like my translation of dance in my day-to-day -day world is so important to me, but that doesn't mean I gave up dance altogether. And there are super inclusive dance companies in the more traditional ballet route, the more um, less traditional contemporary jazz fusion roots. If she loves to move, if she loves to dance, she loves to perform, she can do that with a college degree, without a college degree. And she can just continue to do that as um, something she does on the side. She could do it, continue to do it as something she does as a professional. Like I still dance technically professionally, but that doesn't mean my be all end all is absolutely dancing. So that's my quick long story short. Um, one thing I do wanna let people know is as a virtual reality augmented reality producer, I do have a piece here at Mixed Asian Media Fest, um, Litao. It's one of the first ever Filipino virtual reality experiences that were ever produced. It was truly Filipino American about the Philippines American production company, but then we brought in more Filipino production companies to really even out the distribution of uh, representation and inclusion, both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Um, it's an animated piece, check it out. Um, it's about children who have to swim to school in the remote islands of the Philippines. It's a Pixar style short inspired by Bao. Uh, and I'm gonna pass the word, if you wanna find me, you know where to find me, just click my name on all the different handles. I'm gonna pass it over to Lola to wrap us out so we can say hello and good night to each other and goodbye until next time. But yes, passing it to Lola. Okay, um, I gotta get out here in 10 minutes. So um, you can find my writing on Mixed Asian Media, on the Nerds of Color, and also on the Center for Asian American Media. Um, my short film interview with Anaswan will be available to show at Manifest until this Sunday. So if you haven't seen it yet, if you wanna check it out, now's your chance. Um, what else? Uh, I have two novels available. 
uh, called A Moment's Worth and an Absolute Mind. So if you haven't read them yet, be sure to go check them out. Support independent authors like myself. It would mean a world and then some. And then what else? Um, oh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Echo Lauren Lola. And yes, Echo is an A-K-O, which means I am. Yes, I know it's supposed to go after the name, but I'm just using it like an English language structure because why not? But yeah, that's where you can find me online. And also real quick, um, keep an eye out for a crowdfunding campaign next month for a project I am collaborating with, um, with San Francisco artist Christian Kabuai. Um, I'm not going to reveal any more than that than now, but just stay tuned. Love it. Love it. All right, y'all. Let's call it. Hell yeah. I appreciate this everyone fun, here. This was so much fun. <laughs> I can't wait to have you on and talk further everything, Michaela, again. And Lauren, when your new projects drop, I would definitely want to promote that. But yeah, I could talk to you all day, man. And this is a, a true pleasure. Thanks, y'all. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful Manfest. Have a wonderful rest of y'all's week. Let us know what you thought. We'll see y'all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.